Good evening to all of you. It is 7 o'clock. If you will, take a Bible and open it back with me to Daniel chapter 7 in our Old Testaments. We're going to do a good amount of reading here in the first few minutes of our time together. In our Bibles, we'll have other scriptures uh, on the screen behind me in just a little while. But if you've got a Bible, open it, if you will, to Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to do some reading together. If you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one hopefully beneath the row of chairs in front of you, and I'll give you plenty of time to turn back there. We're glad that you're here Glad it's a little easier to get out this evening than it has been in recent weeks. And uh, we're looking forward to a good study together this evening. Daniel 7 is going to be our text. We want to begin, though, with a word of prayer. If you will, bow with me. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, you are almighty. You know everything. You are everywhere You are all powerful and we humble ourselves before you this evening. We thank you that you are a God who hears. We thank you that you are a God who sees. We thank you that you are a God who is above, outside of time and all limitations. And we depend upon you. We cast ourselves before you and and we present ourselves as sacrifices to you and we trust uh, that you are sovereign over all that you rule even this very evening uh, that you know where we are and that you hear us we thank you for that we thank you for this gift of prayer and uh, this avenue that we have to commune with you because of the intercession of your son we thank you that we are not walking this pathway of faith alone we thank you for our brothers and sisters throughout the world we thank you for this local church and each member who makes it up and we pray especially this evening that you would be with us all young and old as we study as we learn we pray that all of us would look into your word and that you would be able to use the next few minutes to shape our hearts shape our understanding Give us courage and hope. Remind us of our purpose. Sharpen our our determination to live for you today and tomorrow and the rest of this week and, and the rest of our lives. We thank you that our king is no longer in the grave. We thank you that we are able to approach you in the name of a risen Savior. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray tonight. Amen. Daniel chapter 7 is where we are. Material is not only back in the back, it is also available freely online. I'd encourage you to get a copy of that and have a Bible open there to Daniel chapter 7. Of course, if you were here last Wednesday evening, you know that we kind of hit the pause button on uh, our textual study. We spent six straight weeks walking from Daniel 1 to Daniel 6. And then last Wednesday evening, we just paused And we spend a good amount of time, nearly all of our time, talking about the nature of apocalyptic literature. We spent uh, the first six weeks just looking at the historical accounts that are contained in Daniel 1 through 6. But then if you're familiar with the larger book of Daniel, you know that a significant shift takes place in Daniel chapter 7. And we begin reading odd sorts of things. They are not like what we ran across in Daniel 1 through 6. And so we paused to take a giant step back and just look at the big picture. If there's one phrase that we're going to use over and over again in talking about apocalyptic literature over the course of the next few weeks and even over the course of the next several months as we move from Daniel to Revelation, that phrase we're going to hear over and over and over again is the big picture because that's what apocalyptic literature is all about. Don't get intimidated by that big A word. It comes from a Greek word that literally means to reveal. And we want to remind ourselves of that over and over again. The aim of Daniel 7 through 12 is not to confuse. The aim is to reveal. 
The aim is to show us behind the scenes what's going on. Isaiah and Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation are all examples in whole or in part of this kind of communication. It provides a vision of the future. Something that is going to happen and it provides a vision in order to generate hope in human hearts so that men and women of God will be faithful in the present. We noted last week that this sort of literature speaks into difficult circumstances. Literature like this shows up when it is hard to be a man or a woman of faith. We'll notice as Daniel goes along and as we get into Revelation, one of the most common questions that is asked is, How long, O Lord? How long will these difficulties endure? Enter this kind of literature to answer that question. It gives a glimpse of the future from God's perspective in order to generate hope so that men and women of God will be faithful in the present. And if there is one main point Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation. If there is one main point, God wins. None of this has taken God by surprise. God is able to use the righteous and the unrighteous in order to accomplish his purposes. God is able to work in the light and in the darkness to bring about his will. God is ultimately going to win and you want to be on his side. Now, We've got our Bibles open to Daniel chapter 7. We briefly looked at this, uh, the first several verses last week, just as an illustration. But it's been seven days. You've slept since then. I've slept since then. So we want to remind ourselves uh, of what was going on there. Notice in Daniel 7 and verse 1, this takes us in one sense back in time. Uh, Back to the first year of Belshazzar's reign, okay? Belshazzar is a, 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 a ruling authority in Babylon. It's about 10 years before Babylon is going to give way to the Medes and the Persians. And so this takes us back somewhere between Daniel 4 and 5 chronologically. What I would like to do with you is just to read this. Daniel 7 All together, so that we get the big picture and then we'll come back and talk about it, okay? You've got your Bibles open there to Daniel 7. Begin reading with me in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. And it is the sum of the matter that we want to read together. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them another horn, a little one before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, 
And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking on that fourth beast. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet and about the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and uh, before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the other ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed. But I kept the matter in my heart. All right. We said last week, one of the keys to understanding this kind of communication is to try and appreciate the whole forest, right? Not get uh, into studying in too much detail the bark in verses 3, 4, and 5, right? But the whole forest of the whole vision. And that's why we've read together. 
think with me, big picture wise, about what has just been communicated. This is, as we mentioned, the first year of Belshazzar's reign. Remember, Belshazzar is the one eventually who saw in Daniel 5 the writing on the wall. And it said, you have been weighed in the balances and found one thing. And so now the kingdom is going to be taken away from you and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night when Daniel interpreted that vision, that is when the power shifted. Now, we've already been told something that that you and I don't naturally see unless we have a really good grasp of ancient history. We tried to put it into words, those first two bullet points at the top of our material. This is about 10 years before Babylon gives way to the Medes and the Persians. It is the year that Cyrus usurps the throne far to the east of Babylon and begins a new empire. And even though people at that point in time didn't really appreciate what was happening, this was the start. This very year when Daniel had this dream, this was where the empire of the Medes and the Persians really began to get some traction. So think about that. We're 10 years away. No one in Babylon knows what is going to happen Daniel knows that Nebuchadnezzar has risen and fallen. He's in the past. Now Belshazzar is on the throne. What is going to happen next, especially for the people of God, right? We got a glimpse into the character of Belshazzar in Daniel 5. Remember, he's the one who has all of those vessels of the temple that we've been studying so much about brought in and they're drinking from them all and there's just this big raucous party with all of those holy things that had been used in Israel. We're 10 years out, but this is the year that the wheels really begin to turn. And one of the things that Daniel chapter 7 undoubtedly begins to bring out is, is it going to get easier for the children of Israel or harder for the children of Israel? It's going to get harder, right? You read Daniel chapter 7, it's not going to be a bed of roses in the future, right? There are four great beasts. And remember, we studied in detail about all of this same sort of thing back in Daniel chapter 2. The four great beasts very much correspond with the four different sections of that uh, statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. In Daniel 7, the first of those beasts is like a lion. It has eagle's wings. If we read the whole thing, each one of these beasts represent what, according to the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7? A kingdom, right? At first they are described as, as kings, but we read even further, and we find that those kings represent kingdoms, right? And so as we read this, it's important for us to grasp the whole vision and realize that a kingdom is being described. In this vivid detail, right? We're encouraged to imagine what this would look like and appreciate the fact this is a kingdom. Well, the kingdom in play at this point in time, of course, is Babylon. This is where Daniel and his compatriots have been literally for decades now. Remember, he is an old man. At this point in time, there is a second beast that arises like a bear. It is told, arise, devour much flesh. And this also represents a kingdom, right? What comes after Babylon? That is the empire of the Medes and the Persians that is about a decade out from taking control of the entire known world. After this, in verse 6, there was a third beast. Like a leopard, four wings of a bird on its back. The beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. That also is a kingdom 
What comes immediately after the Medes and the Persians? It is the kingdom of Greece that we will learn much more about, Lord willing, in Daniel chapter 8. After that, verse 7, I saw in the night visions of fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had iron teeth. Do you remember the material that the fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2 was made up of? It was as strong as iron. Right? Same sort of thing here. This kingdom devours and breaks in pieces and stamps what is left with its feet. It is different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. Tuck that in the back of your mind. Because very much the same sort of thing is going to crop up again in the book of Revelation. And guess when the book of Revelation, which one of these empires the book of Revelation occurs in? It's this fourth empire. The empire, of course, we know of as Rome. Strong as iron that spreads far, much farther to the west than any of those other kingdoms had stretched. But here's the turning point, okay? We begin in Daniel 7 and verse 1 and we read the first eight verses and we think, what in the world is this all about? Here's where it begins to get interesting for the people of God. As I look, as all of this is happening, thrones were placed. You remember if you've read Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, it is a great throne room scene. And there's not just one throne on which the Almighty sits, but there are many thrones. These, these great and terrible beasts are all out here and we don't know what in the world to do with those. And as Daniel is looking, there are thrones that are placed and the Ancient of Days takes his seat. When you read that phrase, that designation, the Ancient of Days, what do you think of? Something very old. What? Someone very old, would you say? What? Uh, I think, I think uh, as I look at this, we're referring to God. Okay. Uh, Why do you say that? Yeah. He, uh, just, as, just as we respect uh, and search uh, for wisdom, that we would you know, inquire with older individuals. We inquire about, you know. But they would, but they would be individuals that we respect. Uh, they would be judged correctly, you know, because of age and everything. Okay. And look, look at this: is this is the ancient of days? He is one ancient day. Okay. Someone worthy of listening to, Alan. What do you think of when you read this? <laughs> I think that uh, God created the earth, and before time ever started. Time, there was no time. Uh huh. He's there, right? We, we referenced in our material uh, two statements from the Psalms. For instance, Psalm 90 and verse 2 to Alan's point. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, everlasting in the past, everlasting in the present everlasting in the future, you are God. Or Psalm 93 and verse 2, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Now, let me ask you, Nebuchadnezzar, as awesome of a person he was, and everything that he's able to accomplish, literally building one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. Could Psalm 90 verse 2, those words be spoken of him? No. How do we know that? Well, he's no longer even on the scene here. I mean, we're, we're living 2,700 years after all of this happens. It's only been a matter of years in Daniel's life, but Nebuchadnezzar is already in the past. Nebuchadnezzar had a beginning, he had a middle, and he had an end. 
as great as Belshazzar is, you know, able to call at will and have all of those beautiful things from Solomon's temple in Jerusalem brought forth. And you can do whatever you want with those things. We read Daniel chapter 5. And the man is literally shaking. His knees, we were told, were knocking together as he saw this hand writing on the wall. That can't be said of Belshazzar. As great as Cyrus and Darius are going to be in, in the age of the Medes and the Persians, they're going to come and they're going to go. We'll look into the life of Alexander the Great. 400 years before Alexander the Great is born is Daniel chapter 8. And he's prophesied about. But as great as that man is, as much as he's able to accomplish in 33 years worth of life. Did you think about Alexander the Great today? Before this evening? How long has it been since you thought about Alexander the Great? Right? He's come and gone. As mighty as all of the Roman Caesars were, even getting to the point where they expected people to worship them as God on earth. They're in the history books, right? But not the ancient of days. Who is from everlasting to everlasting. Mark, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Another aspect of that, and I find it interesting is he, he took his seat. Yeah. I, I, I could think of the judge when he walks into the courtroom. Yeah. He's all, he is already judge, but now when he takes his seat, that's when things get serious. Yeah. Think about it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, Four spoiled, rotten children that are making a mess right in the basement. And then the door opens and the Ancient of Days comes in and all eyes, you know, mouths shut, eyes look up, and everyone's on their best behavior. Because you know, this is the truly awesome one, right? All of these beasts that, you know... From a purely human standpoint, they're awesome, right? What do you do even with this? How could you possibly hope to go to war against a four-headed leopard with wings and win, right? But that's nothing compared to when the Ancient of Days comes in, takes his seat, his clothing is white as snow. The hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. If it's been a little while since you've read Ezekiel chapter 1, go back and read that and you'll find much the same sort of things in Ezekiel's apocalyptic vision. A stream of fire. Imagine a stream of fire issuing out of God's throne, coming out from before him. A thousand thousands serve him. I don't know what you have in your mind when you think about angels and the number of angels that there are but listen to this 10,000 times 10,000 stood before this ancient of days the court sat in judgment and the books were open what do we make of this court that that begins to play a part in all of this we've got these four terrible beasts the ancient of days comes in he takes his seat he is truly awesome and there is a court that sits in judgment and books are opened that sounds an awful lot like what we're going to read toward the end of revelation right but what what is being communicated here alex <laughs> You have a court of a king and his nobles. Yeah. The nobles have a say in whatever judgment the king is about to issue. Okay. But ultimately that king has the final yeah. and the only say that true in that. There is no question as to who is in charge here, right? Who is able to pronounce judgment? Who is able to raise up and humble? Who is able to speak as to what is going to happen from here on out, right? The court sat in judgment and books are opened. What ought we to think about that? What, what ought Daniel to think about when he reads that? 
books are open, Phil. Like courts in Zen. Yeah. And judgments are going to be pronounced. Okay. Is there anything that has escaped the notice of the ancient of days? No. It is as if everything has been written down. And when it is time for judgment, the books are opened. Once again, doesn't that sound an awful lot like one of the closing scenes in the Revelation that John receives, right? There is a great white throne and everyone is gathered around that throne and books are opened and the book of life also is opened. And if anyone's name is found written in that book, they are on the right side of the God who is going to win. Ruby, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so keep the, the, the whole scene in your mind. Four terrible beasts, and they represent literally hundreds of years worth of human rule right and increasingly they make it more and more and more difficult to be a man or woman of faith in service to God but then the ancient of days comes in and he takes his seat and it is time for judgment I looked then Daniel 7 and verse 11 because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking now you envision this this is that little horn on that fourth beast and you imagine how comical this really is okay you've got four great beasts and then the ancient of days comes in and he takes his seat and there are ten thousands times ten thousands that are gathered all around the books are open it is time for judgment and here's this little yammering horn over here that won't shut up right and it still thinks even in the face of the ancient of days he is someone great we we find that this horn is is a king right of that fourth empire so we think of Rome we think of someone exalting himself much too highly John says, as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. What we make of that, you know, Good luck. I mean, there's, there's going to be some time that's going to occur here, right? This isn't happening instantaneously. But what's the big point? The Ancient of Days wins. You align yourself with one of these beasts, and it might make life easier for a little while, as if for a season. But if you're on the side of the beasts... And not on the side of the Ancient of Days, even though life was easier for just a little while, you have aligned with the wrong side. Daniel 7 and verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Now, what I would love to, to try and get into our minds this evening is how much more we know right now than Daniel knew. Think about that. What you know of Jesus, even if it is the most elementary of knowledge about him, you know more in a lot of respects about the big picture of the Bible than Daniel could possibly know, right? This is why the New Testament tells us those of us who are Christians, we now see plainly things that prophets and even angels longed to look into. Think about that. But also think about your knowledge of Jesus. 
If you've already read over the material, you know they're number two under questions worth thinking about. Son of man, interestingly enough, was Jesus' most common self-description. When he referred to himself, most often he would use son of man. He did it more than 80 times in the Gospels. That's significant. Think about that. And it's easy for you and I, especially if we've been reading the Gospels for a very long time, just to read right over that. And yeah, that's Jesus. But something's being communicated there. If this is the phrase he uses most often to describe himself, that ought to make us perk up a little. As disciples of Jesus, what ought we to think? think and to hear when we run across him describing himself in in that way. Alex, go ahead. Two things come to mind. First is, Jesus was the first child that was ever mentioned in the Bible. He prophesied about long before Cain and Abel were even born. Okay. But then on top of that, you have Jesus presented the kind of man God always wanted every single human being to ever live. Okay. And we fall short of that. He's man as God intended. Okay. Perhaps, uh, Alan, go ahead. Uh, you know, even though he was the son of God, uh-huh. he became son of man when he died. The deity is still exists. Mm-hmm. And he became like you and I. Yeah, and that, that's what I was going to uh, kind of expound upon over here as well. You know, it's one thing for us to read about the ancient of days and to try and imagine how magnificent and awesome he is. We can relate to Son of Man much more easily, right? And of course, in the larger scope of the Bible, that that just blows our minds that Emmanuel is God with us in human flesh walking around. Think about this, okay? In Daniel 7, keep your hand there and go back with me to Acts chapter 1 very quickly. Acts chapter 1. And I want you to think about what we're told here and begin to put the pieces together. Remember, in Daniel's vision, this is occurring in the age of that fourth beast. Right, And even though that beast has exercised great dominion, his dominion is not going to be able to stand up against the dominion of God. You remember what we read in Acts chapter 1 after the death and the burial and the resurrection and those resurrection accounts. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, when they had come together, Jesus and the apostles, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The topic of discussion is kingdom rule. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Certainly sounds like the ancient of days in Daniel 7, doesn't it? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. In Daniel, they're described as holy ones. We've already run across that. We'll run across it again before we're done. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, think about that. Perhaps you've never thought about Daniel 7 and Acts 2 side by side. Where did Jesus go in Acts chapter 1? Did he just go up into the realm of the birds? Or beyond that into the realm of the stars and the moon? Or did he go beyond that? 
Of course, we understand he's not in space as we understand it. He is in heaven, right? That word that we have translated into English is used in a variety of different ways uh, to describe a variety of different things in the scriptures. We understand Jesus finally, as was his intense desire, went from the earth back from whence he had come, right? Acts chapter 1 is the way that we described it last week, kind of like the the earthbound, we're on the other side of the curtain, we're just seeing the stage, we're seeing it all unfold historically, but there is someone behind the curtain, right? We see one side of the tapestry and it looks very confusing and disjointed and we wonder what in the world is going on. But when we're given a glimpse on the other side of the tapestry, it is beautiful. Think about Acts 1 in connection with Daniel 7. We're in the age of that fourth beast that we've identified as the Roman Empire. In the night visions, Daniel says, I saw with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Is that not the heartbeat of Acts chapter 2? The very first gospel sermon. God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. Very much like the apostles did in Acts chapter 1, right? So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the thing. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. You read Romans and First and Second Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and so on, all the way through Revelation. And is that not ultimately at the heartbeat of it all? It's hard right now to live for God, but you be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. In Acts 7 and verse 19, I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, the horn made war with the saints. More than one occasion in the book of Revelation, we're going to be read about war. War that is very relevant to what's going on right here, but also war in heaven, right? But who wins that war? God wins that war, right? Does Daniel get all of the answers to all of the details he's looking for? No. And that's important for you and for me to get as well, right? Are there things that we would love to know about this that we can only speculate about? Of course there are. We're in good company right there along with Daniel. But the big point is what? War is being waged against the saints and the horn prevails over them. Lots of Christians lose their lives in the first century and the second century and the third century AD. But when the ancient of days comes, judgment is given for the saints of the Most High and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Who wins? God wins. 
Verse 23, thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise and another shall arise after them. This kingdom is going to last for a long time, right? He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for time times and half a time but the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion the dominion of that horn shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him here is the end of the matter god is going to win it is such an incredible vision that it shakes daniel up right you and i as we read that need to keep at the forefront of our minds the purpose behind this it is going to be hard to be faithful to God. But you choose to be on God's side and you're on the right side of history. Okay? Unfortunately, we are out of time for tonight. If you have not gotten a copy of lesson number nine that takes us into Daniel 8, I would certainly encourage you to do that. And if you've got more that you'd like to talk about, I'd love to do that with you afterwards. Thank you for being here.